Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are definitely 100% going to get our sleet wheat farm started. But first, a couple updates on some bugs that we saw during the last episode. You'll now notice that there's only 35 grams of carbon dioxide in this sort of secondary ranch. And you may remember I was talking about there being something wrong with the slicksters because they just weren't eating enough. We received a couple of great recommendations says, hey, put them all in their own room, protected by, say, a little liquid lock that would allow the eggs to be separated from the rest of the slicksters so that they would eat at 100%. Here's the reason why you don't have to do that, though, or at least shouldn't have to do that. There's 206 slicksters. Even if they're eating when they're less than happy because they're cramped, overcrowded, glum, which would mean that their metabolism is reduced by 80%, at 206 slicksters, it wouldn't matter. It does matter over here to make sure that they're all happy so they can eat that one gas pipe full of carbon dioxide. But over here, even though they're only eating at 20%, it shouldn't matter. But as suspected, once we relaunched into the game to record this episode, they all started eating just fine. Additionally, we have since landed the Enterprise to restock on food for one final mission. They only have one ton of plastic left to convert over into databanks. But you may also remember that the carbon dioxide was not exiting through the gas pipe. Well, once again, when we restarted, all the carbon dioxide vented into space as it normally is supposed to do. So this is something we're definitely going to be keeping an eye on, and I'm probably going to end up restarting in the middle of episodes a lot more. Because yeah, we're at cycle 1100, but we have a lot more that we want to accomplish. We're going to explore and colonize every single planetoid in this star map. Also on today's agenda, we're going to be finishing up the research tree. We don't have that much left. And the great thing is once we're complete, we'll be able to get rid of all of these research buildings to include the material study terminal over on Frostalin. And that will definitely help with not only power, but Miko Nala. We've started our Bristle Blossom Ranch, because remember, the reason we want the sleet wheat is because we're going to be sending all of it and the bristle berries back to our home colony so they can create berry sludge. Why berry sludge? Well, it doesn't go off. It says exceptionally long shelf life, but what it means is an infinite shelf life, which is absolutely perfect for our space program. A couple of updates in and around the colony. One of the problems that we're continuously facing is oxygen production. You can see we haven't been able to keep all of these Atmo suits full. And it presents little problems like by the time the duplicates come grab this pickled meal to be able to drop it off into a rocket, the suit availability has gone down, especially considering so many dupes need to spend so much time up here ranching these slicksters that they'll end up dropping the pickled meal somewhere. And it has to do with the throughput of this system here. You'll also notice that oxygen's not looking too hot in and around the colony. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to think of another retrofit for this system. One that has a little bit more throughput. And I know what you're thinking. Just use a normal spawn. And you're right, that would be a lot better. But you have to remember, we're using a lot of water on this colony. All these domestically grown arbor trees use a lot of water. And you may remember, this planetoid doesn't have any naturally occurring water geysers. And the planetoid that's connected to it in Frostaline only has this cool slush geyser and this salt water geyser, which is being used to create its own oxygen, feed its own trees, and eventually a whole bunch of bristle blossoms and sleet wheat. So our only choice is to renovate this and make it a little bit more efficient. So what's the actual problem? It has to do with the setup of where these sublimation stations are, how fast the polluted oxygen can rise, be crushed by these deodorizers and turned into normal oxygen. If we click on each one of these sublimation stations, you can see that they frequently get into max pressure situations. In fact, the sublimation stations themselves, because of that max pressure, are only running between 30 and 40%. You can see in the last five cycles, this was 35%, 38, 45, 43, and 34. So this has got to go, which of course presents another problem. We don't have a lot of space around here. And yes, I know there's going to be some snarky comments of how we could exploit these buildings to make them continuously produce no matter what their gas pressure is. But we're not going to do that. We're going to crack this problem for real. We're also doing a whole lot of debris pickup because every little piece of debris has to be calculated. So the less debris in your colonies, the better the simulation should be able to run. But the primary mission of today's episode is going to be able to get sleet wheat. 
on Ariel, we have a tundra biome that should have some sleet wheat. Unfortunately, it's not the easiest planetoid to get to or to conquer once you get there. On the subject of bugs, though, the steel didn't magically reappear, so Rover must have eaten it all. But that's going to require getting a couple of duplicates here, allowing them to dig down in here. And since we're going through all that pain, we might as well set this colony up for sustainability and leave those two dupes here. And then once we get the sleet wheat, we need to have all this set up so we can drop it off which is going to entail a retrofit of this system. As much as I wanted the two thermoregulators in series to be able to cool down the liquid coming through it, it's just not enough. I was hoping that the back-to-back -back thermoregulators taking away 28 degrees of temperature combined with the hydrogen would be just enough to brute force it. And yeah, you can get plenty of water out of it, just not at the throughput that we want, because we want the entire three kilos per second that this saltwater geyser can give. So we're waiting for all this steam to cool down back into water. And then once it does, we're going to break back in there and put a proper thermo aqua tuner in it, which means we're either going to have to add a power spine or find an additional source of power. Now, as I said before, once we're no longer doing research and we're able to get rid of this rad bolt generator and the material study terminal, it will help a little bit. So to start with, we're going to throw in a bunch of extra solar panels and go from there. So I put a little barrier in here temporarily and allowed the dupes to exit suitless that way they could access the rockets. This way there's no problems with being able to load the rockets up with oxalite or pickled meal, and they'll be able to do it without suits. So these suits will be used primarily just for ranchers. And this is only a quick, fast duct tape solution until we get that refined oxygen system online. But this now means the ESS Susan and the Enterprise are ready to go back up. So we're gonna start by hitting the crew button. The Susan has 30 kilos worth of pickled meal and four tons worth of oxalite. So they're ready to start telescoping more areas, looking for that great mysterious source of fullerene. The Enterprise only needs 28 kilos worth of pickled meal because we only have to finish another one ton of plastic. Which direction are we gonna send Susan in now? I think we're gonna start over here, allow them to telescope this object, and then we'll head all the way over here. And this will still be within range. What might even be better is going right here and then popping through here once this is revealed, and that way we get three objects. Yeah, let's do that. As for the Enterprise, we've also loaded it up with another rover, so that way we can go back to Ariel and drop off that steel for our duplicates to use later. Now, while we will have a side-by-side -side launch, I am more interested in studying the heat patterns coming off of here to see what's gonna happen down here. So we're gonna take a quick look at it. Oh, yeah. This is exactly what I was talking about. So, a lot of people don't realize that yes, the carbon dioxide is not going to make it through, but it's going to superheat everything in this area, as evidenced by the massive problem I have now. Yes, this oxygen is at 3000 C. And the reason why it does that is because the heat comes off the bottom of that rocket, I want to say in three tiles by nine. So this is where that heat is going to be dumped. You'll notice it even melted this heavy watt joint plate. So we'll go ahead and upgrade it to steel. And now the body temperature on these arbor trees are going to be suffering for a little while. Of course, it may not be such a good idea to have the dupe build this while it's still 700C around here. Not to mention all that carbon dioxide coming in. This is just bad. And down goes Carol. Thanks to Naz, everything's finished up now. It also helps that the heat in here is already starting to dissipate. It's only been about a cycle, but we'll keep thinking on other solutions. Updating the star map, we can now drop another rover here on Ariel. This ended up being an organic mass field. Not really helpful. As for rover 2, they're going to land here and then just sit here. This rover is actually made out of 100 kilograms of steel, so we can actually deconstruct this one. And we'll deconstruct the rover's lander. And now whenever we come and drop a dupe off, they'll have enough steel once they deconstruct their module to build the rocket platform. Over on Frostalin, our liquid chiller renovation is going well, although the piping can get a little wonky. That's because it was originally designed with gas pipes, so we had to make some odd left and right turns here and there. But as the standard, the water coming in from the desalinator is going to come straight through here and attempt to join this loop. We have this liquid pipe thermo sensor checking the water to see if it's above 15 degrees. If it is, it continues on through the loop. Once it's chilled low enough, it ejects it out to this point and that's where we'll eventually use it for crops. The coolant loop definitely looks a little different, but it comes in through here where this thermo sensor checks the coolant, goes through the thermo aqua tuner and then bridges on through here. Now this loop 
is a lot smaller than this loop. And the reason why that's beneficial is because it'll allow the thermal aqua tuner to cool this down at 14 degrees per step a lot quicker than the, what the water is coming through here. At least that's the theory. We're using polluted water as the coolant and that is going to be awfully touchy. Remember, if you will, that polluted water freezes at minus 20. And eventually all this water is going to be used to cool and provide water for a sleetweed farm. And the coolant has to be at least as cold as the target temperature of the water being used for the crops. In fact, we normally like to have it a few degrees lower. So if we set this on, say, minus 4, it'll bring that coolant down to minus 18, which is not a lot of flexibility down to that minus 20 where it'll start freezing and then breaking the pipes. So to start off with, we're just going to say 0 degrees. If the coolant is above 0 degrees, the thermo aqua tuner will attempt to chill it. Let's get this sealed up relatively quickly, and that way the entirely too much water can start turning to steam. This was made up of just brine and water, but when I originally joined the polluted water for the coolant, I bridged it onto the exhaust of the steam turbine. And for my efforts, we've added another 550 kilos of water to this steam bath. And oh my goodness, there's an errant automation wire in there that's going to have to be destroyed. And I left the ladder in here. I'm just getting too sloppy. And what's great is because this water comes in a little bit less because of the desalination process at about 4.6 kilos. Right now with the current thermal setup, the water goes from about 30, 40 degrees all the way down to 16 on just half a pass through its loop. I think we were also benefited with the fact that the coolant loop is in the center of this brick. We don't even have the brick completed yet and it's already working very, very well. But that chill will emanate from the center and push against the insulated tiles. Out on the star map, the Enterprise and Captain John Archer have completed all of the orbital research. So we're going to go and land them back down and then start the upgrades to this rocket so that it can start delivering dupes. And then great news from the ESS Susan. Not only have we discovered yet another planetoid that we have to colonize, this one called Meteoribo that is metal rich and is the planetoid with the shovels and regolith biome. But more importantly, we have finally found the Gilded Asteroid Field. And the Gilded Asteroid Field is the one with the fullerene. I had been mistaking it for the Glimmering Asteroid Field over here. And the great news is it is exactly a distance of 10 from our home planetoid. So we will be able to use our petroleum rockets equipped with a drill cone and still make the trip without having to get into liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Great job, Susan. I think you can head home. Where we are still heating everything up way too much. While we finish getting the rockets ready, I need to introduce to you the Mopom. That is the mother of all polluted oxygen makers. So I told you we were going to expand this concept in a little, and boy did we. And all we've really done is separate the polluted dirt coming from the ethanol distilleries from our old polluted oxygen maker and is now heading on a long rail path down through the colony, across through as many bricks as we can so it doesn't off gas into the new system where I've conveniently forgotten one auto sweeper. Please stand by. All right, that is much better. When I was looking at this system, trying to troubleshoot on why it wasn't producing as much as we wanted, I realized the limiting factor was the deodorizers. The deodorizers can only consume 100 grams of polluted oxygen per second. So when we play around with this Atmos sensor to try to lower it so it would consume more oxygen quicker, the issue is then that the polluted oxygen would come up too fast and get absorbed by these gas pumps, which kind of made me realize we just had to go wider. Now, if you were gonna make a 100% throughput on these, since they produce 660 grams of polluted oxygen per second, you would need seven deodorizers per sublimation station. In this setup, we only have six, because quite frankly, this is gonna produce more oxygen than we would naturally be able to breathe, and it's a good thing because we wouldn't have enough sand to sustain that either. But as long as these sublimation stations are active less than 75% of the time, these six deodorizers per sublimation station will be able to work just fine. In fact, we have these Atmos sensors set at 250 grams. And you can see we have four full pipes of oxygen. So now the max pressure is going to be fighting against the back pressure of oxygen not being able to get out, which is exactly what we want. Now the system works the exact same way. Sand comes in, goes into the deodorizers, as does all the polluted dirt coming from the ethanol distilleries 
The polluted dirt gets dropped off into two conveyor chutes, which we like because it'll continuously off gas as well if for some reason it is under pressure. Also, those rot piles will naturally convert as well. Each level has two auto sweepers, and that way they can reach all the sublimation stations with the polluted dirt. The next three levels are providing all the sand to the deodorizers and picking up the clay once they're done. The clay goes down through these rails, goes right back into our industrial sauna, where it eventually gets converted back into sand via coal and ceramic. And finally, we made these gas pumps as wide as possible. It's kind of the reason why this is so wide. That way there's no bottleneck on any layer of the system. And as you can see, we have enough oxygen now supplying every single output in our colon here. We even have a little extra one here. I'm gonna take a look at the sand supply after a while and we may feed some more oxalite with it. Now it is a touch power hungry. You can see we're supplying it via three large power transformers, not to count the fourth running the thermo aqua tuner that's cooling the entire process. We have that thermo aqua tuner set on 15 degrees. And as you can see, all that oxygen is chilled nicely. I am absolutely in love with this new system. It is much more refined than my previous one, and we will now have oxygen completely settled for this entire colony. This system has a maximum throughput of being able to supply oxygen for 45 duplicants. And the only thing we would need to do to support that many is provide it with more polluted dirt and make sure we're converting enough coal. But if you've been tracking our polluted dirt, you can see that's not a problem. We have over 500 tons of polluted dirt ready to be converted into oxygen. I think we both can agree that the oxygen overlay looks much better than it did at the start of this episode. Now all that's left is gutting this entire system. That's kind of the fun part, isn't it? From one problem to the next. You can see here on the power spine, and to be clear, yes, the power spine goes just about everywhere. There's about seven and a half kilowatts of power available on it. Yet for some reason, I'm getting brownouts and these batteries aren't moving at all. Just in case I did do a restart to no avail. My guess is that right now I'm using so much power, it only has enough to supply the transformers and not enough to dump into the smart battery. So to try to fight that a little bit, we've added a couple of more solar panels and are starting to cut back wherever we can. The issue is, for instance, these smart batteries think they're 100% fine. That's why I'm thinking that the problem might also just be a... Oh, no. I found it. Don't worry. Silly deconstruct commands. I guess the colony would be hurting for power when it loses the 8,000 watts per second being provided by these petroleum generators. So not a bug at all, just an echo. The Enterprise is ready for its two dupe crew. We had to make some slight changes, moving the rocket control station up here and putting the manual generator down here because we needed to make room for an Atmos suit dock. Now, I think what we've decided is both dupes are gonna come here, try to get as much work done until it's sustainable, and then one dupe is gonna leave and one dupe is gonna stay. The oxygen system, not great. We just have the mini gas pump supplying oxygen to the suits. This trip is gonna be sort of quick. We're gonna make sure we can be sustainable. We're gonna grab some sleet wheat and then head back, leaving one dupe on the ground. So I'm not too concerned with the amount of oxygen here in the Atmos suit. It'll eventually get there. We're bringing along 10 tons of oxalite, and that way our duplicates have plenty to breathe and plenty to load up the suit. I also had to change it to clearance vacancy only because they kept coming in and dropping off their suit, and it was causing problems when other dupes were trying to leave. We're also going to be bringing a lot of pickled meal just in case. This is going to give us 60 kilos worth, and as you can see, what's sitting on the ground is almost 100 cycles worth for one dupe. And I don't think I'm 100% pleased with this mini gas pump. So because it's going to be loading suits, I'm going to replace this with a single size battery and a full size gas pump. A couple of other notes, there's only one mess table and that's going to be okay. The other duplicates still going to grab their food from this refrigerator and since they won't have a mess table, they'll sit right in here to eat it, which means they'll still get the plus three morale bonus for being in a mess hall. Oh, that is so much better with the full size gas pump. Now, because it's the Enterprise, we're obviously taking John Archer, but we're also going to take Jack Died. They're the ones who I think are going to move. There's nothing they can't do. And after we skill scrub them, they'll have a relatively low morale requirement and be okay with the digging that we need to give them. And before we launch them, I wanted to show you an update on this system. I've tried a couple different things in the background, and I think this might be my favorite. We've connected a bit of automation to this. Now this critter sensor counts the critters in this room. 
if there's more than 24, it just turns the carbon dioxide off. Pretty simple. So when there's a reasonable number, we'll keep feeding them carbon dioxide and they'll keep producing us more oil and petroleum. When there's an unreasonable number, well, they won't have anything to eat. Our two pilots are ready. I've checked both of their suits. They're at 92% and 84, but we did bring some reed fiber just in case. Let's go ahead and remove the building restriction and then send them over to Ariel. While we also superheat part of the colony again. Another update on this beautiful system. It is still cranking out just an absolute monster amount of oxygen. Every single oxygen pipe is chock full. Every single suit is chock full. I wish I would have started this way. We wouldn't even have had to make it that big from the very beginning. It could have been maybe four gas pumps and this whole system. So I think the magic number of layers for these deodorizers is three. Now each of these Atmos sensors is set on 250, but it doesn't really matter because the oxygen up here is almost 1400. But even if we were draining that much oxygen, the polluted oxygen doesn't have a chance to make it all the way up here. And there's enough deodorizers in the way that even if you were trying to vacuum this whole thing out, the deodorizers would be able to handle it easily. Now, even with having max oxygen pressure everywhere, these sublimation stations are only averaging 15%, 16, 22, 26, and they get a little higher on the outside. Oh dear goodness, I forgot one power line. Our rocket is now in orbit of Ariel, so it's time to select Jack Died and get ready to deploy the Trailblazer module. First, we have to make sure that we put them in an Atmo suit and then deploy our wonderful Trailblazer module. I think we're gonna go right about here. There's our existing 400 kilos worth of steel. There's old Rover. And here's the rest of the steel that we need. One of the things I am looking forward to with the next patch is they've fixed the suit animation so that when they come out of a Trailblazer lander, they'll still be wearing their full suit. All right, now let's put a rocket platform right here. Looks like a great spot. And then we're gonna have to get to digging a lot of this obsidian out. We're gonna need it not only to have the ladders to be able to get Jack back inside, but also we're gonna need a material to be able to build ladders down here. Eventually we'll get to this mafic rock and that problem will take care of itself. With the rocket platform landed, we can go ahead and land. While that's happening, we're gonna send Jack over here. Now, we do have the extra 200 kilos worth of steel, which is good because we're going to need it to build a fire pole. Look at this. When Jack dug out this obsidian, some of our steel was sitting behind it. Maybe more of our steel is sitting inside this sand. Oh, look at this. It's more of our steel. Rover didn't eat it. With that fresh obsidian dug out, we can now build our ladder and be able to get right back into the spacefarer module. I'm going to spend a little bit of time micromanaging our way down through here, and I'll be back in just a minute. We might have considered bringing some rad pills. Jack has a little bit of radiation. The good thing is we're going to be able to stop most of it by putting one plastic tile here. So most of the radiation won't be able to penetrate through all the way into this dig shaft. As for Jack, they're going to be fine. Going to the bathroom gets rid of a hundred rads and you can see that they're no longer glowing. Here's a quick example of the power of plastic. Radiation is coming in at 218 rads per cycle. This plastic tile blocks 68% of it. And we'll be able to make that even a little bit better by putting some other materials right in front of it, say obsidian. Now we're blocking 60% by the first tile, then 68% of what's remaining on the second, leaving us with only 28 rads per cycle in the dig shaft. And finally, we've reached a lot of the meat and potatoes to where we'll have plenty of materials to continue building all these ladders. Our strategy is to seal up the shaft open as much up as we can because when we get down here you'll notice there's some oxygen and even some oxalite in some places now being that this is the first distant planetoid that we're going to be trying to colonize it's time that we had a discussion on what our strategy is going to be every planetoid when we colonize it we're going to try to make it infinitely sustainable what's going to hold us back on most of the planetoids is the lack of water here on aerial we have a liquid sulfur geyser a hydrogen vent hot polluted oxygen vent and a carbon dioxide vent. No water. We could get power from the hydrogen vent, and then we could clean this polluted oxygen and be able to breathe it. Then finally, we'll be able to grow our crops using the liquid sulfur geyser, and those crops will be in the form of spindly grub fruit plants. But needless to say, all that stuff takes a lot of equipment and more dupes. So I think what we'll end up doing is bringing another rocket here with a bunch of equipment and even more dupes as sort of a construction crew. Something to note in order to get through this top layer of magma is eventually you have to punch through abyssalite. Not a big deal for Jack, who's pretty good at the digging, but something to keep in mind. Now the question is, 
Where is my sleet wheat? We're going to do some casual digging over here. I see what looks like a tundra biome, hoping that there's some sleet wheat there. But either way, there's a lot of materials in here like sulfur and sandstone that will help us out. I really got to get better at looking at a temperature map before we just start digging into places. Now, for obvious reasons, we're not going to dig up any of these wild planted spindly grub poop plants because they may be a source of food for us in the future. And look at this beautiful, beautiful sleet wheat grain and a nice little hot tub. Don't think we're going to end up using that anytime soon. One thing it does look like we're missing on this planetoid that we'll need is dirt. And I say that because I was planning on starting with outhouses. But so far, there's no dirt that I've been able to find on this planetoid. Plenty of sand, though. And I suppose while we will be quick enough to get that crew over here and get all the infrastructure in place, there is a lot of oxalite here. So Jack is going to have plenty of oxygen to breathe. Additionally, we could just route that hot polluted oxygen straight through some of these tundra biomes and cool it down. Yeah, it's not great that he'd be breathing polluted oxygen, but there's plenty of sand here. We could even filter it out. And since it's only one dupe, we only need 100 gram per second. I suppose another strategy would be to set up some interplanetary launchers and launch the materials over there. In order to do that, you need radiation. Is nuclear power actually on the menu? Well, look at this. I found one tile worth of dort. We've also gotten access to this beautiful sleet wheat. Now all we need to do is load it up in here. Fortunately, we won't be needing this second cot. So we'll deconstruct it, and then we'll build a ration box in its place. And that's where we'll throw all of our sleet wheat. Over on the planetoid itself, Jack is making his bedroom. Now eventually they'll have another duplicate join them, but for now, this is going to have to be it. And before we forget, let's also build our wonderful mini pod. We're going to go ahead and adjust Jack's priorities. When you have relatively few dupes, you don't want to be setting these, especially on a colony all by itself. Otherwise, they'll just continuously do the building and digging and not do some of the necessities like taking care of the outhouse or cooking any food that you might need cooked. Elsewhere on the planetoid, we have a small barracks set up, a mess hall, and what's going to be a bathroom. This is the only dirt that we have on the colony though, so it's not going to last very long. Of course, I say that, but that's almost a ton of dirt, and just one load of the outhouse will last 14 or 15 different cycles with only one duplicate on this planetoid. We've also found another vent or geyser. We're going to check it out, and then we're going to get ready to launch Captain Archer back home. This would be an example of some of the bugs that we face, and I don't mean the Sweetle. Notice that the Sweetle was levitating for quite some time before deciding to drop down. You ever have that nightmare that you were left on a planet? Jack's about to. Bye, Jack! Don't worry about Jack, though. They're going to be just fine. They have bathrooms ready, a little bit of fresh water, and now that we have that dirt, we're going to be able to throw down a couple of extra planter boxes. Five spindly grub fruits is plenty to feed one duplicate. In fact, we'll even put them right here. That way the Sweetles can tend them. And we'll check on Jack here in the next few episodes. But the good news is our sleet wheat grain is heading to our home colony. And although I was hoping to get more done with the sleet wheat, at least we know it's coming soon. I think for the next episode, it's going to be necessary for us to go nuclear. This will be the first time I've actually done a video with nuclear power. Unfortunately, because we don't have much room, it's probably going to have to sit somewhere out in the middle of space. But at least all that radiation will be conveniently located next to any interplanetary launchers that we're using. So let me know what you think in the comments below about the progress we made in this episode and our aims for the future. And I'd really like to take this colony as far into the future as we can, bearing that the bugs and the lag don't cripple us beforehand. I've spent entirely too long recording this episode. In fact, looking at the software, I've been going for seven hours. So I'm hoping to be able to start putting the episodes into smaller, more focused chunks. Because right now, I think I'm trying to bite off more than I can chew in a single session. Let me know what you think about that as well. So until next time, signing off with Jack here on Ariel. I'll talk to you soon.